Good morning everyone, I hope you're all keeping well and welcome back to another morning service of uh, the family. And uh, well, yeah, I hope it's been a lovely week for you all. And uh, before we go into today's uh, sermon, let's just give our time to the Lord. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you today. Lord, we thank you for the time that we can come before you and just uh, worship you and honor your name and also just sit at your feet and hear what you have to say. We're going to open up the scriptures today, Lord, and continue with the uh, the, the the message of, of marriage, Lord, and we just pray that the hearts and minds again will be attuned to you as we continue to go into what it says about marriage. And Lord, help those go into your word so that they may be able to understand for themselves what you have to say, not only about the eternal marriage that we are uh, leading towards, but also the marriages and relationships on here on earth. So, Lord, just give this time to you and may you get all the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, so uh, we're going to do a bit of a recap on last week because um, we spoke about the book of Hosea and what that meant and what he was called as well as Jeremiah calling for repentance. A beautiful little scripture about Israel and Judah and how he wanted them to turn back to him as, uh, his, as, as their husband. And uh, then a little later, we looked at the parable of the unforgiving servant in uh, the book of Matthew, speaking of how uh, forgiveness can either harden the heart or unforgiveness can harden the heart and forgiveness can certainly uh, keep it soft. And then we dived into the marriage and, uh, you know, Matthew spoke about marriage and divorces. And remember the, the rabbis, the two different schools of thoughts, the conservatives versus the liberals and you know, how husbands and wives needed to keep their hearts pure to the Lord. Well, soft towards each other and pure to the Lord. Remember the clean hands and pure heart? And then also through that uh, account, we could look at how, uh, you know, ones that are seeking his kingdom first are wanting to shepherd his flock, as well as a great proverb that we learned last week. Now, uh, we also refer to belief and unbelief and also how... Um, Ephesians spoke about how Christ loves the church and how that can be displayed through the husband and also the wives, how they are able to uh, submit, but it's an equal submission under the Lordship of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then also touching on the point of the Sadducees, uh, questioning the resurrection and also no one knowing the day or the hour. And finishing off last week on uh, Corinthians, which was talking about uh, suing or do not suing the brethren so let's pick it up from there because that that will give us a good start for today and overlap from from last week's discussion uh, on on uh, marriage itself and as we learned last week that the corinthians were suing each other in non-believing courts and uh, that was due to a, pe a period or uh, in time of, of uh, self-seeking uh, greed and uh, rather than uh, you know, accepting uh, material loss, they, they wanted to, uh, you know, fight their corner, which then caused more uh, concern and devastation. But even the, the uplifting part was that even though past um, incidences like this happened, God had that redemptive, restorative uh, process in mind. And uh, even the uh, situations in those times and uh, people that had made errors before, they uh, can be or were fully restored cleansed from sin which was you know washed clean set apart for god which was sanctified as well as accepting in his holy sight which is justified and uh it also gave them an opportunity to re remember their lifestyle that they led in the past so that they could then lead others and you know uh through the cleansing of the lord be able to be sanctified and be able to help others in those areas and uh, we did have a look at last week the forgiveness of uh, past corruptness. Uh, but if you want to listen to that, go and listen to the message. But we're going to uh, open up with the first passage of Scripture taken from uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses uh, 12. So as we read today, uh, let's do so, honoring the Lord. And it's now talking about how, uh, and I think this is, would be a great way to open up, is glorifying God in body and spirit. All things are lawful me, for me, but all things are not helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. Foods for the stomach and the stomach for the foods, but God will destroy both if, both 
it and them. Now the body is not for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. And God both raised up the Lord and will raise up by his power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a harlot? Certainly not. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a harlot is one body with her? For the two, he says, shall become one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. Flee sexual immor immorality. Every sin that a man does is outside of the body. But he who commits sexual immor immorality sins against his own body. Or do you know, not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you? Whom you have from God, and you are not of your own. You were bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. A great illustration and opening account of how we can keep ourselves pure, uh, you know, from any sexual immorality and anything that may defile the body. And, uh, you know, um, a couple of notes that I just want to read through here is that uh, the digestive and sexual functions of the body are not in the same category. So in other words, the stomach and, and the sexual organs have their unique differences and purposes. And uh, eating sustains the body while sexual behavior involves the self-identity. And because of God's resurrection design for the body, an essential identity exists between the present physical body and the future glorified body. Sexual intercourse is more than a physical experience, it says, and involves a communion of life. Since Jesus is one with the believer spirit, it is unthinkable to involve him in immorality. Sexuality is a uniquely profound aspect of the personality involving one's whole being. Sexual immorality has far-reaching effects with great spiritual significance and social complications. So, as we open up with that passage of scripture saying we've been washed clean, we've been uh, washed, sanctified and justified, let's hold that true to ourselves because uh, under the, the, the blood of Jesus who went to the cross to die for us, we are able to be forgiven for our past. And I pray that if there's any current sin that falls under that, you are able to uh, find someone who may be able to lead you into restoration, as well as uh, seeking counseling for that. So I just want to encourage anybody out there, this is not a message of condemnation, because there's no condemnation for those in Christ, but uh, certainly conviction and an opportunity to be able to have a look at how we can improve. So when we look at uh, the Holy Spirit. We did finish off last week on the Kingdom Dynamics. So again, if you want to um, go through that, then that's that's great. We're going to turn our attentions to 1 Corinthians uh, 7, which talks about the principles of marriage. And now I'm going to read the first few verses. Now concerning the things of which you wrote to me, it is good for a man not to touch women. Nevertheless, nevertheless because of sexual immorality, let each man have his own wife, and let each woman have her own husband. And let the husband render to his wife the affection due to her, and likewise also the wife to her husband. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. And likewise, the husband does not have authority over his body, but the wife does. Now, that's quite an interesting one, because that almost implies that there's a um, ownership of someone else's body, which, you know, um, in this context, I think what they were trying to say is that... Uh, the, 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 they're trying to refer to the marriage and the sexual intimacy belonging to the husband and wife. So in other words, you know, it's it's between the husband and wife that uh, leads the sexual, uh, you know, um, course of their lives. And obviously uh, their body doesn't belong to anybody outside the marriage. And I think that's the message that's been coming under this particular passage of scripture. Um, now, you know, this was coming from the Corinthians that were asking or inquiring about these various problems. And, you know, he was uh, doing his best to try and guide them in a way that will help them understand. But if we have a look at a kingdom dynamic here, which is a good little nugget to, to uh, refer to, talking about the responsibility of the sexual relationship. And it's about family. Sexual intercourse is an intimate expression of affection between a husband and a wife. The apostle underscores its importance in marrying by declaring that it is in fact a duty. A husband is to be available for his wife at her request and a wife for her husband at his request. 
The Bible calls sexual intimacy in marriage a privilege mystery by which two people, a man and a woman, becoming one. And the privilege is abused when people who are not married to each other uh, have intercourse. Then the intended blessing becomes a cause of judgment. But a marriage is one and only place that God has provided for sexual union. In that setting, it becomes a powerful symbol of the love between Christ and the church. A pure sharing of joy and delight in one another that is a gift from the hand of God. Outside those boundaries, it may be destructive. Now, I want to share with you that uh, we all fall short to the glory of God in whatever way it may be. But I'm going to refer to um, sexual relationships in this instance. And uh, there's nothing too far that the Lord can redeem uh, in within yourself or with uh, your partner or your husband or your wife. Let's extend that to relationships in the workplace. And I'm not talking about the sexual side, please. <laughs> Don't get me wrong. I'm just talking about the restorative work that he's got. But in this case, let's look at uh, husband and wives. Because uh, the intimacy that comes from that comes within that marriage. So I'm just going to focus on that. And then while I'm speaking about that, I'm also going to ask you just to think about the eternal um, uh, relationship. Okay, obviously it's not a sexual one, but it's just looking at that intimacy and how you want to preserve and hold on to that um, that that wonderful love that that the Abba Father gives us as our husband, and he's coming back for his bride. So you know we're going to look at a, a, an earthly context, but just you know, in terms of keeping your temple pure, just think of the eternal um, marriage. Now you know uh, we all, as I said, fall short to the glory of God, but. In whatever way that may be, the Lord has a plan and a purpose for all of us. He's given us a hope and a future to give us something that we may be able to strive towards. Now, if there's anything that has come in your life that re revolves or involved incidences like that, and you know, you bring it to the Lord and you ask Him for that forgiveness. And when the time is right, and as the Lord leads, you are or may be able to, you know, um, have that uh, intimate conversation with uh, your husband or wife if that's ever happened and you may be able to bring that to them in a way that will be able to bring and restore trust and also to restore the relationship uh, you know in 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 the best way that the lord has guided but i would certainly uh, seek uh, you know um a believer's counsel uh with regards to this so that you may be able to uh, bring it under the 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 the, the uh, purposes and the plans of god and that someone who knows the scriptures will be able to understand and guide you through that uh, time. But anyway, let's uh, let's move on to the little next uh, portion, which is talking about keeping marriage vows. Now, to the married, I commend not I, but the Lord. A wife is not to depart from her husband, but even if she does depart, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband. And a husband is not to divorce his, his wife. But to the rest, I, not the Lord, say, if any brother has a wife who does not believe and she is willing to live with him, let him not divorce her. And a woman who has a husband who does not believe and if is willing to live with her, let her not divorce him. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean. But now they are holy. But if the unbeliever departs, let him or her depart, and a brother or sister in Christ is not under bondage in such cases. But God has called us to peace. For how do you know, O wife, whether you will save your husband? Or how do you know, O husband, whether you will save your wife? The beautiful word wealth there is reconciled, and that's talking about to change, exchange, re-establish, restore relationships, uh, make things right, remove an enmity. Five times the word refers to God's re reconciling us to himself through the life, death, and resurrection of his son, Jesus Christ. Whether speaking of God and man or a husband and a wife, uh, the katalasso describes the re-establishing of a proper, loving, interpersonal relationship which have been broken or disrupted in the past. Beautiful scripture, which gives us a good number of nuggets here, is that it's first saying, you know, don't divorce your wife. And, you know, the most important thing is the sanctification that comes from one one believing, just one believing person who believes in our Lord Jesus Christ. And, you know, their, their love towards Christ and their relationship with Christ may be able to save the whole household, but it's up to the Lord to save the rest. 
it's not up to the individual, but by the individual being true and faithful to the Lord uh, may have that positive outcome. Who knows when? Uh, maybe immediate, or maybe uh, you know, a, a, a good number of years later. But the heart behind it, the message behind it, is that when, if you are living with an unbeliever, and uh, if you are finding yourself to be the believer, what 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 Paul is saying is that by you being a believer, you are actually putting yourself in a position of covering your your family. And if you're an unbeliever and your husband or wife is a believer. May that be an encouragement for you that uh, that that believer is is uh, loving you as Christ loves the church, whether it's a husband or a wife, and uh, prayerfully uh, that may be able to cover the whole family. But it also does say that if there's a departing be uh, unbeliever who leaves, then the believer is under no obligation, or uh, what does it say? Um, he's no under not he's not under bondage in such cases. So it's 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 a very much um, the Lord says, but I say. So there's a bit of a both in there, you know. So I'd encourage you to open up up, up that scripture just to, you know, dive into it if you have any uh, queries about that. But you know, then it goes on in verse 17 of chapter 7, verse uh, 1 Corinthians 7, which is saying, "Live as you're called," you know. And uh, I've made a couple of notes so that we can go through. Is that, um, you know, when when we are uh, saved, we believe in the Lord and uh, you know there's a secular versus spiritual aspect that goes on which um, is evident in this passage but our eternal calling and destiny takes priority but there's also the political and social uh, distinctions now remember last week I think it was last week that there's we, we did speak about that you shouldn't uh, be married under a social pressure uh, you know under under forced conditions because that's not the will of God it needs to come out of a place of willingness and a place of intimacy and trust but also what matters is obedience to God. And, uh, you know, uh, from a social point of view, it doesn't dictate the terms of our lives in Christ, whether we are free or slaves or whatever it may be. But uh, the most important thing is for the believer's spiritual life to remain constant and intact with an unredeemed and uh, changing world. And it's, uh, yeah, certainly something we can uh, hold on to during these times and seasons. So my encouragement for you is that, uh, you know, with all the changes that are happening in this world, it's um, certainly putting the marriages to a test. And, uh, you know, the most important thing that all marriages that I would advise is keep your communication open, um, keep your intimacy. This is why I'm going into this, uh, you know, sooner rather than later is because, the, the the intimacy between the husband and wife is vitally important because I mean anything outside of that marriage uh, you know if you go and seek your 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 identity outside your marriage in a sexual context then that certainly may bring consequences that may not be favorable to you and others and you know I'm uh, you know I'm speaking to you about this from love and experience um, and it's just a a bit of a equipping moment for you to be able to hold on uh, to, to what God has ordained and, and through the stormy waters we keep our eyes on the Lord and He'll be able to guide us, navigate us. Remember last week I was speaking about finding your own time with the Lord and then also coming together so that uh, you may be able to be strengthened and also bringing that whole family underneath that uh, that prayer covering and time together with the Lord because it just strengthens you and it just will then be a great testimony for you to be able to share with others that will glorify Christ and also be able to um, help you maintain your your intimacy, your your identity in Christ, though, um, but also as a as a husband and a wife. So that's just a word of encouragement. But you know, let's move on a little bit now. Well, before we move on, I've got a couple of proverbs that I was just reflecting on um, this morning before uh, this um, message. And the first one that I want to share with you is to Proverbs twelve, verses four, and this is an encouragement for you know. Husbands and wives, because I'm going to take a little bit earlier. Uh, you know, I saw something a good number of months ago, and it was a little picture of how the husband was had this boulder on his back, and he was lying on the ground trying to hold his wife up. And meantime, the wife was over a ledge, and there was a there was a snake that was inside a crevice, and it was trying to bite her arm and. Uh, I think that was a wonderful description of how husband, how marriage can work sometimes, that the husband's laden with burdens and uh, the rock symbolized the burdens and, uh, you know, trying to keep his wife up while she's being attacked by circumstances that uh, he can't see. And um, 
she can't see the burden on his back. So that's very important uh, description of, of, of how sometimes marriage can work. But, you know, if you can un keep that picture in your mind when you're going through difficulties, understanding each other. Well, you know, understanding that sometimes we go through our pressures on a daily basis that, uh, you know, leads to these uh, challenges. But, you know, find that intimate time, you know, that date night or uh, whether it's a, 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 a put the kids to bed earlier and just have a chat, a heart to heart, uh, you know. Even if it's over a shed tear or whatever it may be, it just allows that um, release from the uh, the daily pressures to come out, and then also helps your 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 husband or your wife to understand, or your partner to understand the challenges that you're going through, so that you may be able to edify one another. But you know, in uh, Proverbs, uh, let's have a look. Proverbs twelve, it says, uh, "A good man obtains favor from the Lord, but a man of wicked intentions." He will condemn. So there's a message for uh, the the men. And a man is not established by wickedness, but the root of righteousness uh, righteousness cannot be moved. So there's an encouraging word for you men out there: is that just uh, you know remain righteous in the Lord and through what He says, and you know seeking His face. And also, you know, in verse four it talks about how an excellent wife is the crown of her husband. Now I'm going to read a, a kingdom dynamic, which is talking about the wife, a crown to her husband. And that's women's in God, a woman in God's design. Crowns are related to wisdom. A crown encircles the head. It originates from a word that means to encircle, either for attack or for protection. And the wisdom, in effect, surrounds and protects the mind and brings honor to the head of those who has it. And this verse declares that the godly woman also is a crown to her husband. When she is received as God's gift, her husband will benefit from God's wisdom through her, much as Abraham did from Sarah. The husband of such a woman will be known in the gates and when he sits amongst the elders of the land. And the woman who cultivates her relationship with God first, then relates appropriately to her husband. It will powerfully influence him in every area of his life. So, you know, that discussion that I was talking about when you're sitting down, if you are, as a husband or a wife, in the Word, meditating on the Word, praying on the Word, when your husband or wife opens up about certain challenges, you'll be able to refer to these uh, scriptures to be able to point them in uh, an encouraging, edifying way that will be honoring to the Lord. So there's an encouragement both for men, husbands, and wives, women. Another one which is I came across and shared with someone else uh, is uh, taken from Proverbs. And uh, Proverbs 31 talks about a virtuous wife. And uh, I'm going to read a little kingdom dynamic, but you can read verses 13, 21, 25, and 27 to get a bit of an understanding. And again, it's talking about women in God's design. And a, a virtuous woman not only cares physically for her home, but she also is a watchman over the emotional and spiritual condition of her family. The Hebrew word for watches, which is uh, tepa, is also translated to watchman. She works willingly with her hands, two kinds of which are mentioned in Proverbs 31. And cuff symbolizes up, upturned hands and extended in prayer and yard ministering or serving hands. Confident in God whom uh, she prays, the effective woman knows she has eternal significance. Lovely little passage of scripture there, isn't it? And it's just an opportunity to, uh, you know, equip, encourage, exhort you, both husbands and wives, and, uh, you know, uh, may be something that will get you deeper into the Word. There also comes times in marriages where the one spouse is uh, not well and the other one is holding that other spouse up, uh, you know, or in a relationship. And that's also a time where that um, giving and taking can come into play because, you know, we all go through struggles. And if we can understand the struggles that we go through, like I said, with the conversations and the intimacy and the trust is the most important thing. And also looking into the word. Firstly, it sustains you. It will sustain you because you're seeking the word of God. Seek his first the kingdom of God and all his righteousness shall add, be added unto you. But then you're also doing so in faith, hope and love. And then that will give you an opportunity to be able to equip and encourage uh, through prayer and biblical accounts, scriptures that will be able to encourage them. So let that be an encouraging word for you. But now we're going to turn our attention to uh, the unfortunate times in, uh, you know, married life where you may lose a loved one. And not only um, I want to just touch on this is that I also want to uh, speak to the unmarried uh, people. Now. 
Paul was talking to the Corinthians and they were, uh, he was referring to the marriage state or depending on what uh, situation they were in. Now, in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 25 to 40, Christ doesn't give a teaching himself on the subject over the discussion with regards to this. But Paul, while not disclaiming um, inspiration, stresses that he's giving some sound advice in this context. And his uh, teaching, in light of the tension between the temporal and the under-redeemed secular order and the believer's spiritual life and calling, uh, speaks of the entire stressful situation, which is um, uh, looking at things from a temporal point of view or eternal point of view. And while we seek our life in Christ and see what he says about us and the way that we are to live, he also talks about uh, the opportunity of being able to allow the widows to be able to keep their hearts pure towards the Lord, as well as the unmarried to be able to equip themselves in case the Lord has someone that comes across their path to be able to be with them. It goes into quite a lot of detail. So I'm going to encourage you to go through 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 25 to 40, to go through these things that will help us and guide us in all things. But, you know, while you, while you go through this, have, have a sensitive heart, and as a, have, a, have, a, have a conscience that will be able to understand that every person's situation is unique and different. Let's have a read through it. Now concerning virgins, I have no commandment from the Lord, yet I give judgment as one whom the Lord is in his mercy has made trustworthy. I suppose, therefore, that this is good because of the present distress, that it is good for a man to remain as he is, you are bound to a wife, do not seek to be loosed. Are you bound to a wife? Are you loosed from a wife? Do not seek a wife. But even if you do marry, you have not sinned. And if a virgin marries, she has not sinned. Nevertheless, such will have trouble in the flesh, but I will spare you. But in this I say, brethren, the time is short, so that from now on even those who have wives should be as though they had none, and those who weep as though they did not weep those who rejoice as though they did not rejoice, and those who buy as though they did not possess, and those who use this world as not misusing it, for the form of this world is passing away. And then it goes on to say that uh, not wanting you to be without care. And then I'll let you read into that a little bit further. Let's turn our attention to Timothy, the book of Timothy, which uh, speaks... Uh, lovingly and caringly about uh, the situation with, with regards to the great apostasy. Let's read the first five verses. Because there, ca there may come a time in marriage that one believer will stray from the Lord or um, be uh, backslidden or just, uh, you know, not find a place in his heart to be able to be as intimate as he was before. And in those circumstances, it may be quite challenging for the for the other uh, spouse or person in that, that relationship, because uh, you know these these things do happen, but uh, it does say in the Bible that these things are going to happen. But it is an opportunity for us to allow Him to shine our light through the situation. Now, the Spirit expressly says that in latter times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their own consciences seared with a hot iron. Forbidding to marry and commanding abstain from foods which God created to be created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. For every creature of God is good, and nothing is to be refused if it is received with thanksgiving, for it is sanctified by the word and prayer. The Holy Spirit in this context speaks openly and prophetically about these situations and um the latter times is talking about the first resurrection and the second resurrection. And that's the coming of Christ. And departing from the faith means denying the essential doctrines of faith. And, you know, um, that includes our walk with the Lord as believers or Christians. And it's, that's why it's very important for us to understand what it says in the Word so that we can rightly divide the Word of truth. But that takes time. That takes um, a space where you have your time with the Lord and the intimacy because it does talk about the deceiving spirits and false teachers are uh, teaching doctrines other than what the, what the Lord is saying. 
which may even um, affect the leaders. And that's something to uh, remember. Uh, 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 one of the messages that was sent is keeping that dial, well, keeping keeping it uh, directed towards the, the Lord, because if there's one degree out as close as we are, as we move forward, we may be 10 degrees out. And that's something to hold on to, is as we guide and navigate our way through life with the Scriptures, we're able to try and stay on course like that plane. You know, sometimes it misses its beak, but it doesn't go too too far off course. But if the beak is turned off, in other words, if this relationship is 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 um is is put on the back burner, we may be ending up going quite a lot off course, which then leads us into a total different uh, destination. So let that be an encouraging a word for you. But in verse three, it talks about a person who departs from the true faith, falls prey to all sorts of uh, uh, traps, and uh, they are alleged to make one more spiritual but actually is uh, is 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 far from it and likely the uh, teachers that claim some food should be avoided because that defile a person is also something to be cautious of very important for us to understand this because if we don't get into the word of god and understand what he says about situations and about decisions that we may need to make and un understandably uh, which we're going to look into next week about honoring the elders is 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 it's also always good to get that advice uh, get that uh, accountability from uh, elders especially when it makes decision concerning others as well as yourself so that but ultimately it's the relationship with the lord but you know it's a case of seeking the lord first and see what he says and you know go go speak to one of your elders or your um uh, you know your 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 priests or prophets I'm uh, sorry, your pastors, and, and speak to them about um, what it is that, that you are, um, you know, weighing up. Uh, and that then allows you to be able to be spiritually equipped and also to be able to not be led away because you're going to be getting it from the Word in the first place. <clears throat> 1 Timothy 5 speaks about um, honoring the widows. Now, we touched on widows and the unmarried a little bit earlier, but I'm going to read through uh, the first few verses so that I would be able to encourage you with the rest. Honor the widows who are really widows, but if any widow has children or grandchildren, let them first learn how to show pity at home and to repay their parents, for this is good and acceptable before the Lord. When we look at being responsible for our families, we want to do things that will be able to look after them, both physically, um, emotionally, and spiritually, as the best we can. And, you know, not everything, although it's important, not everything is, is based around the uh, financial, physical support, but it is important because um, that, that shows your willingness to uh, look after your family. But it's, it goes way beyond that. It goes towards the emotional and spiritual um, well-being of your family and you know sometimes you might find yourself uh you know uh, getting a check in the spirit when there's something that may not be in line to the lord's uh will but it's also an opportunity for you to go to the lord in prayer firstly bring it to the lord in prayer ask the lord to work in the hearts and mind of, of that family member or family members and also to perhaps maybe have an opportunity when the time is right to be able to reflect, uh, you know, Christ's love through that situation or scenario that will be able to, um, you know, uh, bring comfort and 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 uh, guidance to them. Now, in this context, we're talking about uh, widows, and you know, widows are a great value and asset to any church, um, but it does encourage those that are, uh, you know, um, descendants from that widow. If they are able to care for that widow, then that takes the burden off the church. But if there's a widow that really doesn't have any support, it's a great honor for the church to be able to support them. And it's also, uh, you know, being able to perform the duty of the family patriarchs, which then brings that uh, generational uh, blessing to the fall. Um, but what happens if that's uh, not possible due to external circumstances? Does that mean that, uh, you know, you're not honoring God? No, I don't believe so. I believe he sees your heart as, you know, men sees the, the, the outward appearance, but God sees the heart. Just want to hold you in that space for now, is that, you know, your efforts and your obedience is the main thing. And pray that the Lord will bless that, because you are doing it for his glory, not for anybody else's glory. 
So, have a read through that. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verses 3 to 16. Let it be an opportunity to see how you may able, be able to help grow your, your relationship with the Lord, your uh, spiritual relationship, family relationship, as well as your biological family relationship. It's just uh, finding ways to find solutions, but with solutions that would be honoring to God. Because it's uh, as we're going to read next week about honoring the elders, it's effectively you're honoring the Lord. You know, everything, do everything unto the Lord. But it's actually when you're wanting to step into the place of being a servant leader, you, you find opportunities to do so that will be able to equip the church, you know, co-labor with the Lord, with Him building His church, which will then affect future generations. So always have that future generations in mind, as well as current, because that's a, it's a blessing to the Lord. Okay, we're going to look at all the things, and as we, you know, um, start uh, closing up our time together, we're going to be um, looking at one or two verses that will be able to uh, give us some hope in a future through these difficult times. You know, um, marriage is, is a beautiful thing. Um, and even if it's been tainted with, um, uh, with, with unfortunate incidences, it doesn't mean that that's uh, the way it's always going to be. Whatever way that re restoration process happens, as Paul said, you know, live as you are. Um, you know, as, as the other book says, you know, just find a place of that intimacy with the Lord that he'll be able to work things out for the good for those that love him and are called according to his purposes. But the beautiful thing, as we've read before in Ephesians 3, chapter 14, verses 21, it's talking about the appreciation of that mystery and every family in heaven and on earth. And that also then brings us to uh, a beautiful passage of scripture, which we can relate to during these times, is that um, eventually the Lord will reign over all. And in Revelations chapter 19, it talks about how heaven will exult over Babylon. And it's talking about the voice of the great multitude, which exults over triumph, over righteousness and truth, uh, as opposed to difficulties and challenges and trials and tribulations. Um, let's enter his courts with thanksgiving and praise, because that gives us uh, that alleluia, that praise to the Lord, that according to the passage in the New Testament, is uh, a, a worthy, worthy thing to do. We are all here to make a purpose unfold through his love and through his guidance, and also to make a difference out there. <clears throat> We are servants, and a word worth speaking of servants is the word denotes to one who is um, subject to another. And it's usually translated to either a slave or a servant. And often the service involves is voluntary, which is a, a person willingly offering through obedience, devotion, and loyalty to another, subordinating his will to him or her. And the word is used of natural conditions, as found in Matthew chapter 8, verses 9 and 18, verses 3, and metaphorically to describe a servant of Christ, of God, and of sin, as well as of corruption and evil. So it's a very important message for us, is that as we continue to go into uh, the future, and as we continue to walk with the Lord, I just want to encourage you that every step that we take, just have in mind of the eternal purposes that God has. You know, the prayer, the model prayer, Matthew 6. Let's read through it quickly. Um, Matthew. In fact, I'll finish off with it. Um, I'll finish off with it. But before I do so, let's go to Revelations 21. Now, we've looked at how the heaven will exalt over Babylon. So let's just keep that in mind in terms of exalting over any bad situation, any situation of slavery, any situation that's not favorable at the moment, keep in mind that heaven will exalt itself over Babylon. It will win. And in that sense, a little further on, it does talk about how in Revelations chapter 21 talks about all things being made new. Now, as I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, also there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw a holy city, a new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, a tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God, 
and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, no sorrow, no crying. There shall be no more pain, and for former things have passed away. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, and I will give of the foundations of the water of life freely to him who thirsts. He who overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. But the cowardly and unbelieving and the murderers and sexual immoral, uh, sorcerers, idolaters and liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. But we know that we in Christ have the second life. So as we finish off today, I just want to encourage you through all these um, scriptures that we've shared over the last two weeks. Uh, it's, a, it's a message of, of hope, faith, hope and love that will give you a, a purpose, a destiny and uh, an appointment that God has set for each and every single one of us. And uh, through the accounts of uh, preparing, uh, being in that marriage like Hosea and also just going through the challenges of life, I just want to encourage you through the word of God, be, be equipped and be prepared that your hearts may be able to be uh, turned to uh, flesh and that your uh, st uh, heart of stone can then change also to the heart of flesh because that's so important for us. And that's why he says he'll wipe away every tear. And whatever suffering we're going uh, having here on her earth is temporary. It's temporary. And if there's any illness or any sickness that uh, has uh, plagued a family member or any death that has come about uh, through illness, we know where they are right now. They are up in heaven. And it's also... Uh, a heaven that also can exist on earth because uh, we we believe uh, that uh, in heaven there is no illness so we call upon uh, for the healing to come from heaven down to earth so that the lord may be able to do the healing and the restoration process not only in illness but in our marriage in our relationships in our community in our nations and across the world so as uh, Matthew chapter 6, which is what we're going to close off today, uh, speaks of the prayer. Uh, because the Lord knows what you need before you even ask. But uh, as it says in the word, and this is what we're going to close on for today. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Yours will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us our day, our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive, uh, forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Right, I'm sending you all the love in the world. And I just want to uh, encourage, equip, strengthen, exhort, comfort all those people out there who have been listening to this message. And be faithful and be strong in the Lord and know that his plans are good. So we'll see you next week. I hope you have a lovely, lovely day. Sending love.